Okay, um, hopefully everybody can see my screen very well. So uh, again, thank uh, for the organizers for inviting me to uh, these uh, great uh, seminar series. It's my honor to present our recent journey on uh, ultra wide paints for subambient radio cooling that includes materials, physics, and the climate crisis mitigation. I'm from uh, School of Mechanical Engineering at the Burke Nantar Center at Purdue University. Um, so this is the outline of my talk today. Uh, first, uh, we will show some motivation background that um, kind of inspire us to pursue this work, followed by materials, physics, energy savings, and climate crisis mitigation. Uh, eventually, I will go through some outlook and future directions. Motivation and the background. Okay, so on this picture, we see a lot of uh, air conditioners, especially units, uh, well, window units uh, in this image use kind of a uh, commonly in the more kind of developing countries. Um, in the US and Canada, probably the central air conditioning units are more common. But anyway, uh, these are large number of air conditioning units to improve a uh, human uh, living quality. But at the same time, it causes uh, problems uh, showing on the right, uh, you know, this is the urban heat island effect where uh, the city center can be five to eight degrees Celsius hotter than the surrounding areas. Uh, in addition to that, um, the uh, space cooling uh, use a big sector of uh, power either in the commercial sector or the residential sector. You can see that 11% uh, and 60% uh, respectively. At the same time, uh, they are big contributors to uh, CO2 emission. Uh, so in 2020, uh, it, the, the statistics says is 113.6 million metric tons because of the space cooling. All right, so that's a, a big problem. And we will be seeing even a bigger problem uh, in the near future or in the next few decades. As we see here, these are households with uh, air conditioners. So we can see in the United States, um, Japan or South Korea, which are relatively developed countries, sort of uh, the households are commonly equipped with air conditioners, but still new units are manufactured to replace the old ones. Well, in the more emerging economies like China, they have really picked up in the last decade. Um, the other large population countries, uh, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, India, and so on, you can see that uh, in the next few decades, there are still high, very high demand to uh, equip new air conditioner units. So on one hand, it's greatly improve the living quality. On the other hand, it's going to make sort of our energy and uh, a climate problem uh, even more severe. Okay, so we have been hearing, I mean, these kind of uh, news, especially I put the bad news here. So Antarctic and Arctic areas, they lock highest temperatures on the record. Uh, more recently, India and the Pakistan, uh, they kind of suffered very extreme heat waves. Polar bears are losing their homes. So what can we do with them? You know, uh, as a heat transfer, Scientists, engineer, uh, we, our group really look at, uh, you know, what can we do with air conditioners? So we, let's take a closer look to this industry. So first we realize that they use power, right? The power use often comes from carbon emitting processes. And when you move the heat from inside the space to the outside, we need to sort of uh, consume electricity and that's as a penalty. And uh, that means we even dump more heat than we want it to move uh, to the our ambient and the heat stays on the earth, right? That causes the, the urban heat island effect and eventually contribute to global warming, right? So we started to wonder, uh, is there a way to dump the heat to deep space rather than stay on the earth? And even a better deal uh, for free, okay, without using any power. All right, so that's possible. One kind of a promising solution here is radio cooling. Okay, so how does radio cooling works? Now, we need to look at a system of the sun, the deep space, atmosphere, and a surface on the earth. You know, the four kind of entities to understand uh, the process. Now the sun is the reason where we have lives on the earth. It constantly shines uh, energy uh, of a thousand watts per uh, meter square to the earth's surface. That includes the UV uh, visible near our bands, right, after the and the atmosphere attenuation like ozone will attenuate UV in particular. So we have 3.4 UV, 
42% visible. A near IR band is actually accounting for more than half of the power, which is usually not uh, appreciated much, right? But bearing that in mind, at the same time, the surfaces on the Earth is gonna emit heat uh, to the outside, all right? So just like our human body, we emit heat all the time to our surroundings. And that's why we can uh, you know, use a infrared forehead thermometer to measure our body temperature during these uh, special pandemic time. Uh, so at the same, you know, at, at the same time, any other surfaces uh, will emit heat as well. And because of the um, sort of uh, the uh, winds displacement law, if you have already taken the heat transfer under undergraduate course, we know uh, the wavelengths of that emission will be around 10, mi 10 micron. Okay. So interestingly, our atmosphere is transparent to a spectral window from eight to 13 microns, that is called sky window. So the power emitted within this spectrum window can penetrate through the atmosphere and lost to the deep space. So that's magical about our atmosphere, okay? Now, the power in that sky window is about 150 watts per meter square. And if you have a surface, say, uh, kind of emissivity or absorptivity is zero uh, in the solar spectrum, but the emissivity is high in the sky window. So what's gonna happen is gonna, you know, it's gonna reflect nearly all the sunlight as shown in this diagram. At the same time, uh, the energy emitted in the sky window, uh, 100 watts, 150 watts per meter square, is gonna travel through the atmosphere and eventually lost to the deep space. Now, based on this diagram, we immediately realize now the uh, emitted heat and eventually lost to deep space is much more than the absorb heat from the sunlight. So overall, by radiation, our surface loses heat and eventually we can be cool below the ambient temperature and the convection is gonna eventually, uh, uh, you know, produce a heat load to the surface and the balance that is radiation cooling. So this can be cool below the ambient temperature. All right, that's how it works. We need to find surfaces close to this ideal surface. That's, that's the goal. All right, so radio cooling is not new, actually. Uh, if you read this uh, Scientific American article, this was in the AD 57, all right? It told a story that uh, in the ancient times, like in East India, uh, people are already using uh, this structure to uh, make ice because during night, uh, the surface can lose heat and there was no sun at that time. So uh, the radiation uh, cooling can sort of uh, make the surface to be below the ambient temperature and make ice. So even the, your ambient temperature is slightly higher than the freezing point. This structure can cool water below the ambient temperature and the freeze water, right? Of course, it, it didn't work in the daytime because when the sun is out, we know this surface doesn't look white. Uh, it's gonna absorb the heat and then eventually uh, the heating is gonna win over the cooling, all right? So um, now in order to make uh, daytime cooling, the goal is really uh, create surfaces or materials that can reflect sunlight as much as we can. All right, people have been trying doing that actually uh, from 1970s or 1990s, right? Uh, the, the, so these are the early efforts on really cooling paints. For example, uh, this paper, uh, they put a very thin layer of uh, titanium dioxide commercial paint on aluminum substrate. They did measure two degrees uh, uh, below the ambient temperature, but that high reflectance actually was mainly from the metal substrate. I mean, the commercial paint, they wouldn't provide that high reflectance. All right, so this is another example of, uh, you know, the best paint at that time, but overall, the paint alone, uh, they only reflect the sunlight. I say only, but I mean, the numbers already sounds like pretty high, 80 to 90%. But that means they absorb 10 to 20 percent of the sunlight is not sufficient to sort of uh, uh, be sufficient small enough to uh, be smaller than the, the radio cooling provided via the infrared heat. Okay, so they have very weak uh, daytime performance. I mean, the paint alone they couldn't be cool below the ambient temperature. All right. So recently there have been great success on some of the non-paint approaches. For example, uh, this was uh, from. Uh, uh, Professor Sanhui Fan's group at Stanford, they use a uh, multi-layer nanofilms uh, to achieve daytime cooling. And this was uh, from uh, 
Professor Austin Minnis group at the Caltech with a silicon, silicon mirror. This was a thin film backed by a metal uh, coating at the back. So um, from uh, Professor Xiaobo Ying's group and uh, Rongui Yang's groups. And this was uh, Dininga White Wood from uh, Professor Bing, um, whose group at the University of Maryland and uh, the first author professor, now is Professor Tian Li at Purdue, who is my colleague. Um, but you know, these are great progress. However, uh, we still need kind of a more viable solutions that, uh, uh, that is paintable, that is uh, cost effective, high performance, easy to use, and without involving any metal coatings to provide the high, high re reflectance. All right, that was very hard to, to achieve actually. Uh, otherwise it wouldn't take such a long time to arrive at this uh, paint solution. So let me get to the materials, how to, how to make it happen. All right, so uh, around 2014, our group jumped on this problem. Say, uh, okay, can we look at, relook at the paint again? Uh, now we have better technology, uh, uh, so maybe the nanotech can allow us to make better paints in the 1970s to, to 90s uh, and achieve below ambient cooling with paint approach. So we first model this dual layer structure that uh, uh, has the titanium dioxide coating at the top and the carbon black coating at the, at, at the bottom. So our proposal is that the titanium dioxide will provide the solar reflectance well, the carbon uh, black will provide the high emissivity for the sky window. But later on, we learned that actually the polymer can emit pretty well uh, in the sky window as well. So we don't really need the carbon black coating. But uh, anyway, uh, so this structure should work. Uh, so we model this structure. Uh, directly solving Maxwell equation is forbiddenly expensive. So we went with this uh, Lorentz Me theory uh, coupled with the Monte Carlo simulation. How it works is that we first look at individual particles. We calculate uh, their scattering coefficient, absorption coefficient, and the scattering phase function. Um, then using those uh, as input parameters for the Monte Carlo simulation, as you can see here, uh, we inject many photons and track uh, how the photons travel through the medium. And the ones that escape from the top, that's reflectance. The ones that uh, die out, in the medium that's absorptance and those who uh, escape from the bottom surface that's transmittance, all right? So we're glad that the, this early paper now is kind of widely used by other colleagues uh, in, in the radiation, uh, radiative cooling field. Okay, so before we talk about the results, uh, we first look at some ideal emitters, okay? So here we say uh, ideal emitter one, ideal emitter two, both of them have a uh, very low emissivity. Uh, well, when, they, when you say ideal, is zero emissivity for the solar spectrum, which means that they reflect all the sunlight. But they share, share sort of different uh, sort of emissivity profiles on, at the longer wavelengths. So ideal emitter one has a you know, selective emissivity uh, only from A to 13 and emissivity is zero otherwise. While ideal emitter two has a broadband emissivity, uh, not just in the sky window, but from, I say three to eight and beyond 13, they also have high emissivity, all right? So um, these have different consequences. So we plot the cooling power as a function of the surface temperature for these two ideal emitters. So they cross at a temperature of a 280 Kelvin, which means that they share the same cooling power there. So what is interesting is that when the temperature is below 280, uh, ideal emitter one will have the better performance, right? The reason being when your surface temperature is low, your high emissivity from ideal emitter two will allow the atmosphere to radiate their heat to our surface. And that's the radiation heat, uh, heat load. That's why uh, ideal emitter two has a lower cooling power, okay? For that reason, if you want to cool the surface to a very low temperature, a stagnation temperature, when the cooling power is zero, I mean, the temperature you get will be the stagnation temperature. So ideal emitter one is able to achieve lower temperature there. On the other hand, uh, if, you, uh, applica if your application requires temperature uh, to be fairly high, 
you can see ideal emitter two now performs better. The reason being when the surface is hot, now <clears throat> uh, in the country, our surface can lose heat to the atmosphere uh, through the other wavelengths, right? Because um, now our surface can be hotter than the atmosphere. So really depending on your application, whether you wanna sort of achieve low temperature, uh, then you wanna ideal emitter one. If you uh, have application that the above the ambient temperature, such as electronic equipment enclosures, uh, you can definitely benefit from ideal emitter too. Okay, so this is interesting and now has been used when designing your kind of surfaces depending on your application. Now back to the scattering calculations. So at that time, uh, we look at the different radiuses. So the interesting uh, for the scattering coefficient as a function of the wavelengths. So when you increase the particle radius, you can see that the scattering peak also shifts to longer wavelengths. In other words, each particle size is great to scatter one narrow band of uh, wavelengths, right? The larger particles, they are better kind of in scattering the lo longer wavelengths, okay? No single um, particle size is the best for all wavelengths, right? That's interesting. And this has interesting consequences when we design our nanocomposite. So when you look at the reflectance or reflectivity, uh, here shows a similar idea. When you move to larger particle sizes, you start to lose some performance in the short wavelengths, but you gain the longer wavelengths, all right? Again, no single size is the best on reflectance for all wavelengths, right? So this kind of gave us some kind of indication. We might want to use a combination of different particle size to do the best job for the, the overall reflectance, which was our hypothesis at that time. All right, so anyway, with this single particle size with the best uh, diameter, which is 400, we're able to achieve reflectance of a 91% in the solar spectrum and the emissivity of a 0.95 for the sky window. But based on these numbers, we predicted that we should be able to achieve below ambient cooling during noon hours. Okay, this is the cooling power as a function of the surface temperature again. All right, so the ambient temperature is 300 Kelvin. Now, if there is no convective heating at all, uh, we can see that uh, uh, we will have the best uh, cooling capability. We're able to cool the surface 20 or well, more than 20 degree Kelvin below the ambient temperature, right? Yeah. Now, if the convection coefficient is from six to 12, we can see that the surface can still be cooled from five, maybe to 10 uh, Kelvin below the ambient temperature. So this was a prediction, was pretty promising. There were some like experiment effort uh, in parallel uh, from other groups. This is from one group at the New Mexico. They did uh, sitting oxide microspheres without the binder. So they were able to achieve nighttime cooling and the partial daytime cooling, except for some noon, hour, noon hours, right? Okay, this is a uh, from Columbia group. They uh, did the porous polymer approach. Their pore size are about six micron here uh, mainly, and there are some smaller feature size as well. Uh, so they were able to get below ambient cooling uh, for the 24 hours. Uh, but one drawback is that uh, it's pretty thick. I mean, the polymer was quite expensive as well. So uh, there's still uh, urgent need to develop scalable uh, cost-effective commercial like uh, paints that includes particles and binders, right? And the solvents as well. So, uh, you know, uh, we were kind of designing along the particle size kind of optimization or so. And uh, we have done some experiments on the TiO2 formulation and we're puzzled by one question we got from our experiment. If you look at this, uh, this is a TiO2 root tile volume fraction, 8% uh, paint, the total thickness is one millimeter at that time. We kind of measured 90.1% total solar reflectance. And we did our Monte Carlo simulation with diameter 104 nanometer. That's what we measured. And the results came out to be only 84.2%. So there was a 6% discrepancy, which, which was very significant. Okay, um, so we were puzzled by that. And by the way, the work was done by my um, just uh, recently graduate PhD student, Dr. Joe Peoples. He just joined Intel. 
Then we take a closer look at the SM Im images. Uh, we realize that there are very different particle size here. Some are large, some are small. And what's the con consequence of these multiple particle size? The standard deviation is about 30% of the mean value. Okay, so we went to look at the different size, just like what we did with a, uh, Dr. Zhifeng Huang, who was an uh, alumni as well, I showed the work earlier. Um, so it turns out that uh, when the diameter is 100 nanometer single size, it's, it's the best to uh, reflect the UV band. 200 nanometer diameter uh, reflects best the visible band. 400 nanometer reflects best the near IR band as well as overall is the best solution, okay, for a single size, 100 nanometer. Again, uh, none of these single size is the best for all the bands, right, as we see. Okay, then with that in kind of in mind, we start to take into account the multiple particle size. We can modify our uh, me theory to account for this effect. It turns out that, uh, you know, for, for this multiple particle size, as we hypothesized before, different particle size can scatter uh, responsible for the different wavelengths. And the overall, now it, our simulation turns out to be 89%, which agrees much better with the experiment than a single size. Okay, that definitely shows um, you know, the effects of the multiple particle size. Okay, there are some kind of uh, uh, absorption peaks we're missing because we did not include uh, the absorption due to the binder. I mean, these are the long wavelengths. And uh, now we have another kind of uh, approach. We are able to predict these uh, absorption now in our most recent model, right? Okay, then that inspired us to intentionally design uh, the better uh, particles to do the model particle size. So we uh, included this uh, A, B, C, D, four designs. You can see uh, I mean, the total concentration is 5%. And uh, these are the breakdown of the uh, concentration for each different size uh, together with two single size. So these are the uh, scattering coefficients here and the absorption coefficients. You can see for these uh, uh, like multiple particle size design, like uh, design D, here, it doesn't have any of like, the sharp peaks for a single size anymore, but it looks to be like a more balanced, uh, uniformly high scattering coefficient for the wavelengths, okay? So that's promising. Now we can take a look at uh, the reflectance. So while well, these kind of jam together at the sum of the wavelengths region, I mean, the long wavelength is easier to see, uh, but let's zoom in in the UV portion. So UV, the reflectance is uh, overall still pretty low because TiO2 absorbs UV. Uh, that's uh, the drawback of these uh, pigment. But anyway, uh, we can see the difference between the designs, all right? Um, so some designs are better for like D is a better before 0.3. However, then after 0.3, the other design ex exceed its performance. For uh, the uh, visible portion, we can see the similar, um, uh, scenario, like again, if you look at design D, it's, it's the highest uh, near like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 micron, but then at the longer wavelengths, it was exceeded by other design like C, okay? So if we look at these uh, four designs, A now becomes the best for UV, B is best for visible, C is the best to reflect the near IR. What is interesting is D, D is not the best in neither of these bands, however, come up to be the best overall performer, okay? So the reason being uh, D has the best kind of a size combination of a multiple size, although it's not the best for any band, but it performs fairly well. It may be the runner up for each band. And uh, the other, although they are the best for one band, but they kind of suffer from other bands. So it turns out that the design D uh, is the best solution. So compared to a 400 nanometer particle single size, and uh, that was 88%. Now, this multiple size design D, we got 3% enhancement in, in terms of reflectance. Also, it looks like a small number, but uh, it means we can get 30 watts per meter square uh, more cooling power from design D. Okay, that's significant, right? The total uh, best cooling power uh, for really cooling probably around 100 watts per meter square. So 30 watts per meter square enhancement uh, that's, a, uh, that's a big deal. All right, these are a uh, few tests set up. There, there are two test setups. One is to measure the temperature. Here, uh, we just put the sample in a compartment with some windshield. 
uh, then you can measure whether the sample can be cooled below the ambient temperature. Okay, use a thermal couple to compare to the outside. Another setup is to measure the cooling power directly. So this time we use a feedback heater to uh, sink the temperature between the sample and the, the ambient. In that case, there is no uh, parasitic convective heating from the ambient, then uh, the cooling power measured uh, is equal to sort of the feedback heater power, right? Because everything is uh, uh, in equilibrium, okay? So then uh, use, using this setup, we kind of uh, measure the best TiO2 formulation we, we kind of design. Uh, it's interestingly that uh, it has a very good nighttime cooling, but uh, for daytime, it's only partial daytime cooling, all right? So between 11.30 to uh, 3.30, uh, our, our sample is still hotter than the ambient, right? So early morning and late afternoon, uh, we got below ambient cooling, which is great. Of course, uh, our sample is much cooler than the carbon black, which is a control sample, right? So around the similar time, uh, uh, Professor Hua Bao, our former student, uh, who is a professor at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, they did uh, TiO2 uh, selling dioxide. I also um, kind of uh, uh, participate in this work. Uh, they also measure partial daytime cooling, uh, not the full, day, full daytime cooling. All right, so what's the, what's the problem? The problem with TiO2, as we mentioned, it absorbs UV. So we, we have seen the UV reflectance was uh, very, very kind of low. Um, so to eliminate the UV uh, absorption, we come up with uh, uh, calcite, uh, say, as one formulation because it's a wide band gap, right? So this is our a new formulation with a calcite acrylic and compared to commercial paint. And the size here is pretty essential. It has a more of a, like a nano rod shape rather than a spherical shape. The lens is a 1.7 plus minus 0.4. Diameter is a 518 plus minus 96. So you see the size is well in the range of the solar wavelengths. So our, our, we are at the right size here. Also, we have the size distribution, which help sort of scatter all the wavelengths as well, okay? So with uh, these good properties, uh, we get 95.5% solar reflectance, which means we only absorb 4.5%. That is a factor of uh, uh, two to five reduction compared to commercial paint that absorbs 10 to 20%, as you remember. Emissivity is pretty high, 0.94, mainly due to the polymer binder. So in this case, the immediate infrared heat is much more than the absorbed solar heating, and we can achieve below ambient cooling, right? So this paper uh, was published uh, two years ago on Cell Reports Physical Science, and the patent was filed way earlier in 2018, actually, because uh, uh, the paper review was not so smooth uh, between like journals that we tried. Uh, but uh, in, anyway, the outcome was re really great, uh, the impact. So the key uh, innovations, I mean, we already did simulations and uh, we already know some of them. I mean, that's great to sort of have some simulation experiment uh, going in parallel so they can inspire each other and uh, validate each other. So the wide band gap filler, as I already mentioned. Now, because we use wide band gap, the reflux index decreases we have to use higher particle concentration to ensure we have sufficient scattering. And the particle size is near the solar peak wavelengths. If you are too much off, say if you're going to the several microns region, or going into the tens of nanometer in, instead of hundred nanometer, then you're not on the right size uh, uh, region. I mean, the reflectance won't be great. Okay, broad particle size distribution is uh, a main contributor as well. So, the reason it took us quite a few years to get this performance is that we have to push every like uh, factor here to the extreme. If you miss one, you won't get uh, below ambient below ambient cooling. So, um, okay. So we measured uh, the performance in the field test, and you can see uh, even around noon hours, uh, the temperature of our surface was still more than a 1.5 degrees Celsius below the ambient temperature. And the cooling power over a 24 hour period was about 50 watts per meter uh, square. So it's more kind of a straightforwardly demonstration using this P pattern. We paint the P with our calcite paint and the background with commercial paint. So under regular camera, it just look white. Although our P is slightly whiter than, uh, than the commercial white. 
But thermally, the P is a uh, way cooler than the ambient, well, than the commercial paint. The reason being, you know, we have to, for thermal, we have to look at the absorption instead of the wideness, right? Absorption, we cut by a factor of uh, two to five. Uh, so that's significant. Then we have these a uh, better uh, formulation with uh, barium sulfate acrylic paint. Now barium sulfate has a slightly smaller band gap than calcite. So that makes it the uranium index slightly larger, which enhances scattering. Now with uh, this formulation, we got 98.1% solar reflectance and uh, a larger than 0.95 emissivity. So now we cut the absorption uh, by a factor of five to 10 compared to the commercial paint, right? So we only absorb 1.9% compared to 10 to 20% for commercial, commercial white paint. So because of this ultra high reflectance of, to the solar irradiation, uh, the Guinness World Record team reached out to us and eventually included our work as an entry for uh, them uh, for the uh, 2022 edition. So um, now for the fuel test, we achieve more than 4.5 degrees Celsius cooling below the ambient temperature, even around one hours. And the cooling power was about 80 watts per meter square during the winter time. And uh, if you do the test on the, under summer time, uh, the cooling power will be more than 110 watts per meter square because the cooling power depends on the ambient temperature. All right, so, uh, so that's, that's great. And here we did further modeling uh, in, in these papers to show uh, the important effects of uh, both concentration as well as the multiple particle size. So you can see um, uh, you know, from single size, low concentration to uh, multiple size, high concentration, I mean, these two factors are very important to achieve uh, eventually the ultra high solar reflectance. All right, so here, um, as I mentioned, probably already uh, figure out that when we do the testing under different um, seasons or at different locations, you get different cooling power. So in order to unify the performance of different materials uh, and uh, exclude uh, the eff effect of uh, location, climate, whether we define this uh, figure merit RC, which is uh, the sky window emissivity minus uh, R times one minus R solar. Okay, so R solar is reflected uh, reflectance to the solar spectrum. So this one minus that is absorptivity to the solar irradiation. Now R is a, a ratio between the solar irradiation and the ideal sky window uh, emission. Okay, so what does this RC mean? Okay, now if you multiply this RC by the sky window emissive power, so the first term will become uh, just the emissive power in the sky window. The second term will become the absorbed power from the solar irradiation. Okay, so that's not basically the net radiated cooling power. Okay, it has a physical meaning. All right, so uh, we have to choose like a certain surface temperature and the solar irradiation to make that calculation. So we can choose this to as a standard definition. And uh, R is about 10, which means that, uh, you know, optimizing the solar reflectance is way more important than improving the emissivity, okay? So in other words, achieving 1% more solar reflectance is equivalent to um, sort of achieving uh, like 10% more sky window emissivity, all right? Okay, so it turns out that the, our figure merits are very high, especially the barm sulfate one uh, that was highest around that time. Okay, that was great. So this video shows that uh, it is very convenient to use, a very viable solution. Uh, it is as paintable as commercial paint. It spreads pretty well, like a normal paint. So these are the kind of really the features that was missing from the previous non-paint solutions. And it dries uh, just like normal paints. It is also kind of resistant to water. Okay, so uh, yeah, that was nice work. Uh, we we knew that, but uh, to our present surprise, I mean, it got so much public attention. I mean, the two papers published, you know, for a span of uh, around more than a year uh, was covered by more than 2,000 
uh, news media globally, including the top ones, uh, it triggered more than 4 billion impressions from the readers of those media reports even uh, got attention uh, from uh, the talk shows like Jimmy Fallon, uh, Stephen Colbert, and uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, Live or SNL, all right? So it means great to see the interest from the public, I mean, for saving power and, uh, and uh, fighting the climate crisis. Okay, but then uh, we want to understand the physics in order to design better materials in the future. So we look at the fundamentals, uh, which are the optical properties of these materials. So we used first principles calculation uh, to look at the UV visible near uh, regime that's the solar spectrum. So optical response there is due to electronic transition. Then for the sky window, that's the uh, infrared uh, region, uh, those optical properties are due to the phonon, uh, phonon behavior, okay? So let me go through the, these. Now for the UV visible NIR, uh, we calculated the electronic structure. So alpha cores was the state of the art radio cooling material. So we made a comparison of uh, barm sulfate to that benchmark. So the, uh, the band gap for alpha cores is 8.73 EV. And our barm sulfate has 7.27 EV. So both band gaps are much larger than the uh, solar kind of photon energy, which means that these two materials won't absorb sunlight, which is great. But on, on the other hand, our band gap is smaller than the uh, alpha cores. Okay, that has a, a benefit that actually enables slightly higher reflect index, which enhances the scattering. Okay, so for the IR, the optical response can be described by the Lorentz model, where we have a, a, a spring mass uh, system with a damping factor. So the Lorentz model says that we have a bunch of uh, oscillators that will be able to absorb the photons and uh, emit the photons as well. So the resonant frequency will just be the uh, zone center optical phonon frequency, the transverse optical phonon because EM wave is a transverse wave. Damping factor includes three and four phonon scattering. This kind of a nicely linked to our other uh, main contribution on the four phonon scattering actually. So we can link radiation and the conduction together. Well, after we calculate the phonon dispersion relation or phonon structure for these two materials, we see that in the sky window region, which is eight to 13 micron, or in terms of uh, frequency is uh, about 25 to 38 uh, terahertz. Uh, Barm sulfate has more phonon modes in that region because the material structure is more complicated, right? That's good news. That means we have more absorbers in that region. I mean, eventually enabling good uh, absorption as well as the emission uh, of photons. So here we predicted uh, the N and kappa for both materials. There are experiment data available for silicon dioxide. We can see that the prediction from DFT agree very well with experiment data for silicon dioxide, right? Both N and the kappa. So they are kind of uh, on the lines. And uh, for barm sulfate, the N and kappa were not available. So we had to predict them for the first time. And uh, now these kind of N and kappa are still awaiting for experimental validation, okay? Um, now, what we can observe here, on one hand, in the UV visible near IR, we see that the N is kind of a slightly larger than that for silicon oxide, right? So this uh, blue curve is uh, from sulfate. Now it can give us stronger scattering for the sunlight. Now for the sky window from eight to 13, we should look at kappa. Now the, although barm sulfate does not have sharp peaks as silicon dioxide, but it doesn't have those uh, low kind of values either, right? It has a more uniformly high absorption coefficient, which is good, okay? Uh, so you know, on one hand is because it has more phonon modes, which, which kind of enable more absorption. On the other hand, we have uh, these uh, three and a four phonon scattering maximum here. So three phonon is not so, a uh, four phonon is not so, so significant for silicon oxide, right? But I would say still not, not negligible. However, for barm sulfate, the four phonon scattering is more significant. You can see the black curve is after including four phonon scattering. It's, although it reduced the peak value, but it also lift up 
uh, the, the valley as well. So it results in like a more broadband, uniformly high absorption. That's a benefit. Okay, so overall, then we can put this in a kappa into simulations here, Monte Carlo simulation. So uh, you can see from the simulation, the brown sulfate does show higher reflectance than the alpha cores uh, in the solar spectrum. On the other hand, for the uh, sky window here, maybe a little bit hard to see, but uh, sitium oxide has some dips within the sky window because those low valleys, right? They don't have sufficient absorption for certain wavelengths. But for brown sulfate, it's uniformly high. It's like straight line, high emissivity there. Okay, then we also compared to experimental value from our own group. Again, because of the polymer absorption, there are some oscillations and absorption peaks uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the long wavelength region, which we don't capture uh, from our simulation. However, the high solar reflectance and the high emissivity uh, are well captured by our modeling, right? That explains the physics here. This can guide our future design. You know, with these uh, predictive tools, we're able to screen like other materials. Uh, we actually already have come up with some better uh, or, or newer uh, formulations, uh, which we hope to share in the future once they are published, uh, being authored by, by, by our current students. Okay, so the last top major topic is energy savings and um, climate change mitigation. So this is the kind of the potential use of uh, our our paint. Now, if you think about uh, our recording so far, we have known uh, the surface needs to face the deep space in order to function, in order to cool below the ambient temperature. But then what happens to the bottom surface, right? Uh, bottom surface, usually they face to the ground and then uh, they don't get any cooling effect because they don't uh, have a view to the uh, deep space. So the question is that, can we utilize the bottom surface, right? Okay, so uh, inspired by the concentrated solar power using a trawl, we know it can concentrate the sunlight to the back uh, side, even they don't, do not have the view to the sun. All right, so if we do the similar thing for radio cooling, we put the trowel, then now this time the radiation from the bottom side of the pipe can be redirected and now eventually lost to the deep space, right? It, it, it doesn't have exchange to the ground. Ground usually pretty hot, uh, well, that doesn't have any more. Okay, so this is better uh, with the reflector than without the reflector, all right? Okay, so we did the uh, kind of a proof of concept field test. This one without reflector, this one with a reflector. As you can see, we monitor temperature um, over time. So this is ambient temperature. And uh, so uh, quite expectively, and both systems show temperature below the ambient, I meaning we can cool uh, below the ambient temperature, uh, free refrigeration. Uh, and the system with the trial can decrease temperature uh, more than double uh, the cooling, cooling temperature. If you uh, use a ratio and, and, and plot it, you can see that there is uh, usually over two or more than what we expected. Now, uh, the, this trial actually not only provide the sort of the view to the deep sky, but has other benefits as well. Uh, it can shield the pipe from the other uh, hot surface like the surrounding trees or high rise buildings or so. Also, it shows the pipe from the, uh, the convection. So that's why we see a, like amplification factor larger than two. Um, so uh, then we used uh, these, uh, pipe systems with and without reflector. I mean, as a pre-cooling units for standard air conditioners. So we'll pre-cool the air before it sends to the air conditioner, All right? So is in collaboration with Professor Jim Brown, Travis Horden, and their student Yue Hong, right? And with these uh, different parameters. So it's interestingly, we did this for the different locations like uh, Reno uh, as shown in here. Um, so we predicted that, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the radio cooling system uh, and uh, the concentrated radio cooling system can give us the benefit. For a roof coverage to 100%, we can save uh, electricity up to 70% for the standard uh, radio cooling system and up to 80% for the, uh, 
for the concentrated radio cooling system. All right. So this is not a linear because uh, uh, you know this is a set temperature. So um, yeah, with a concentrated radio cooling system, you, we can cool the surface to lower temperature, uh, but that doesn't mean the performance will increase linearly uh, with with uh, with that temperature. Because uh, as long as your temperature is below the set temperature, then uh, we don't need to turn on the air conditioner. Okay, so that's how it works here. All right. Um, then it also has a pretty significant uh, implication for climate uh, crisis, how we address that. Now, this is a paper by Professor Jeremy Mandai from the University of California, Davis. Uh, he showed that uh, right now our Earth is experiencing like on average one watts per meter square excess heating. That's why the Earth is uh, right now is warming up. Okay, in order to find that one watt per meter square uh, heating, we can uh, apply our paint to one percent of the uh, the Earth's surface because our paint can provide around a hundred watts per meter square cooling power, and one percent will result in about one watt per meter square on average on the Earth's surface net cooling. Right, that, that's gonna uh, offset that one uh, watt per meter square excess heating we have right now. Okay, that can solve the warming trend, right? Of course, that's only on the thermal sense. There are many other uh, effects that uh, um, uh, that uh, the, the warming will have. So this is a effectively carbon negative. What does that mean? Because our recooling can cool down the earth. It does, does not only cool down your house, it also cool down the earth overall. That's equivalent, again, on the thermal uh, perspective, equivalent to taking out CO2 from our atmosphere, you know? Uh, so that, that's, that's why we call it is current to be uh, carbon negative, right? Again, that's only on the thermal aspect. So this approach does not require any refrigerant or water. It's as easy to apply as commercial paints. And, uh, and the, by the way, uh, the cost is very important, but our calcite and the berm sulfate are cheaper than the commercial TL2 pigments. So, uh, so we've put a cartoon here showing that now we have warming earth, but uh, with our paint, no matter you paint on your roof or infrastructure, automobiles, curbside, uh, and so on, we're able to chill down uh, the earth, right? But we couldn't, we should not overdo it. Otherwise it become too cold to live, like, just like Mars. Uh, so we need the right level of uh, uh, the balance between heating and the cooling, all right? Okay, so I'm a very brief outlook. Uh, a lot of work has to be done um, to push this into the real market and uh, have the true impact we hope for addressing the climate uh, crisis. Uh, we need to evaluate the durability uh, or possibly improve the durability to uh, make sure it lasts as long as the commercial paints. And we want to develop color paints because uh, not everybody likes the white color. Uh, so right now it has a, a cooling power, uh, but uh, for the cold climates, we probably want to cool in the summer and heat in the winter. So make it dynamic. There has been uh, quite some work done, uh, but there are still a lot of challenges to make the approaches affordable, scalable, and uh, and and easy to use for for our uh, for our users. Now we can certainly evaluate energy savings, climate crisis mitigation. Our model was very kind of simple, but we definitely need more work done in this area. The tools we have include the first principles prediction to screen uh, better materials. Uh, and then using machine learning by inspired designs to uh, pursue those materials, durability and other aspects, uh, including uh, advanced manufacturing, life cycle analysis uh, for this uh, become uh, okay, viable technology eventually. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, our group alumni uh, who many of them have joined academia at the you know, uh, different uh, sort of locations world, worldwide as well as the uh, industry, um, lots of collaborators uh, within Purdue and outside, our current hardworking and uh, sort of energetic uh, group members, uh, of course, sponsors uh, listed here. Um, so this is a, a kind of somewhat outdated picture of our group. It shows how uh, we, we look like during this pandemic. Uh, so we're proud to have very diverse, uh, talented, and energetic group uh, making contributions to our community. Uh, so eventually, we hope this can be pushed to the real use and help us address uh, these uh, kind of serious questions we're facing now. 
Okay, that's basically my talk here. Um, thank you very much for your time. I welcome any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, 